the iLoud MTM MK2. This came out a few months ago. I'm just now getting around to it, but I was loaned this pair from the manufacturer along with the little microphone that comes with it to do some auto room calibration. These retail for about $7.99 per pair with said mic. They are a powered speaker. They have two three and a half inch mid woofers, a one inch tweeter. Total rated power is 100 watt per speaker and XLR input. Now this review is gonna lean a little bit more toward the objective because I use these as computer desk speakers, as you can see in this photo. I didn't try them out in my living room, so they weren't used as home speakers. And this review won't have that home speaker slant toward it. Just kind of keep that in mind as you're listening to this. Some of the pros about this speaker are it's relatively compact. It has great linearity for mixing or mastering, or if you just wanna use them for desktop speakers, you can do that as well. There's a lot of different switches on the back you can set for desktop use or free field. You can do some treble knockdown or some treble boost if you'd like to. And then there's also the bass extension. Now, personally, what I found was in their native state with the treble the way it is, the treble was a bit too hot. So I wound up knocking the treble down on the back by about negative three decibels. But that was a bit too much. So instead, what I wound up doing was using my computer's equalization and bringing it down by about one and a half decibels. The microphone that these come with for the auto room correction is really quite nice. And I'd say that that's one of the great features of having these speakers. You're gonna be happy that you've had it because one of the problems that happens to a speaker in a room is they just sound like junk. The bass is bloated, the mid range is all kind of funky and stuff like that. Now you get used to it to some degree, but if you can use equalization to help tame those modal issues from the room itself, you're gonna be a lot happier with the overall end result. And in this case, I was. When using the microphone for my setup, it really helped knock down a couple peaks that I had. One was around 150 hertz, and then I had another one around 220 hertz. When those were resolved using the auto room correction, it made the mid-range just sound more lifelike, more real, if you will. And getting rid of those resonances just made my overall enjoyment a lot better. Moving on with the cons. Now, the first thing I wanna talk about is the orientation of the speaker. You see these speakers were set up vertically in my listening room or on my desktop. If you turn these speakers sideways, like flatten them out, you're gonna run into issues with comb filtering. Now, I've got an entire video about that topic called Why Center Channels Suck. Watch that video, it explains it in great detail and you'll have a better appreciation for why you shouldn't lay speakers on their side. Suffice it to say, if you do that, you're gonna be running into some issues, especially when you're in the near field, when a lot of the sound, it really varies depending on your angle. If you do decide to lay them on their side, make sure that that tweeter is pointed right at you. Also, as far as the tweeter aiming, I do recommend if you can get above that tweeter axis just a little bit, if you don't have equalization, then that's gonna do you a lot of good. Like I said earlier, the tweeter was a bit hot directly on axis, so I used equalization to knock that down. But if you can tilt that tweeter level down just a little bit and just maybe sit up slightly above it or slightly below the tweeter level, that'll help alleviate some of that high-end boost that these speakers have on their own. These speakers do have limited bass, which you can imagine. I mean, it's only three and a half inch mid woofers. Yeah, there's two of them. And yeah, it has DSP to boost the low end, but they can only do so much. So below about 50 Hertz, you're definitely gonna need a subwoofer. So with that said, let's go ahead and just move on to the data. All the data that you're about to see is captured using my Clipple near field scanner. It is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment. This is the frequency response. You can see that the linearity is really quite good until you get to the treble area where you boost about three decibels. That's what I was saying I heard when I was listening. I mean, you can definitely tell there's a high frequency treble boost going on. And that's definitely what I heard in my listening. So like I said earlier, if you can orient yourself to be slightly above or below that tweeter, that's gonna help. Or you can use equalization to bring that down a little bit. F3 extends down to about 51 Hertz and the F10 is at 45 Hertz. All this means is that when the speakers get down to about 50 Hertz, they fall off like a cliff. CEA 2034 data set, and then the estimated in-room estimated in -room response really assumes that you're listening to a speaker in the far field, away from the speaker where room reflections really start to become an issue or a concern. In the case of these speakers, they're designed to be listened in the near field, so you're not really gonna have a lot of reflections unless you have a really small room or these speakers are placed really close to a wall. In that case, you're still gonna hear some treble bump just like I did, but that occurs even when you're in the near field. These speakers have a narrowing horizontal, so it's not a constant directivity design. That isn't a bad thing per se. I'm just pointing out that it is a narrowing horizontal response. Vertical 
MTM lobing. Make sure you're within about 20 to 25 degrees of that tweeter. If not, then you're going to hear some significant suck out. So this should go without saying that when you have a speaker design like this, you really want to sit on the tweeter axis. If that's where it's designed to be listened to, that's where these were designed to be listened to. Make sure you're at that tweeter axis. Otherwise, if you're high or low above that point, then the treble is going to sound really unnatural, especially as the mid-range meets that tweeter. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels. This actually looks pretty good for a speaker of its size. And then at 96 decibels, okay, now I'm starting to see signs of, yeah, I'm listening to a speaker that has small mid-bass, mid-woofer, mid-range drivers in it. Multi-tone distortion at the highest output level, which is about 96 decibels at one meter, is really high. I'm not really surprised. Again, small speaker, small drivers used, not expecting them to have a lot of output capability. If you listen around 86 decibels or so, which is a moderate level at about one meter away for the pair of these speakers, and that should be easily attainable. I, I would not recommend listening to a pair of speakers within a meter away from you louder than 86 decibels, or in general, listening higher than 86 decibels for any extended period of time, no matter the distance. So with that said, at 86 decibels at one meter, which is this gray line right here, you're fine. What if you use a subwoofer and you cross it over 80 hertz? What happens? Well, you go from this to this, back to that, and then to this. So you really don't gain a lot of distortion headroom, if you will, if you use a subwoofer, but there is some slight advantage to using a subwoofer in terms of distortion aside from the fact that you're going to get low frequency gain. What about dynamic range or compression? Okay, so according to this graphic, relative to 76 decibels, so starting at 76 decibels and stepping up to 86 in red, 96 in blue, and 102 decibels in purple, which are all referenced to one meter, when you get to 96 decibels, you lose a lot of bass. You're gonna lose some of that attack, that quickness, that punch. If you try to go to 102 decibels, which is 26 decibels of dynamic range, you're just not gonna get it. These speakers are SPL limited. If I play multi-tone signal through these speakers, which is like a pink noise signal, basically the highest amount of SPL I was able to attain was about 94 decibels at one meter for this pair of speakers, at least in terms of broadband noise. And that does it for this review. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, leave them in the comment section as always. If you'd like to support this channel, you can do so one of two ways. Join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner, or you can just use any of my generic affiliate links that are in the description below. So for example, if you wanna go buy something from Amazon, maybe some new deodorant or some t-shirts or something like that, go to amazon.com. If you got a new TV that you're wanting to buy from Crutchfield, go to the Crutchfield link, click on that, and then buy that. That earns me a small commission at no additional cost to you. And it's a great way to support what I'm doing without you having to come out of pocket even more. And I appreciate that. All right, I'll talk to y'all later. Take care. Double deuces. Peace.